Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Scaletrains.com YouTube channel. I'm Drayton Blackgrove, your host. I'm joined by Mike Hopkin, one of the original Scale Trains founders. I'm also here with Mitch Weaver. He is a conductor on a Class 1 railroad. And, of course, I'm joined by the one and only Tony Cook from Model Railroad News. Guys, thanks for joining me here tonight. Hey, Drayton. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So I'm here in East Tennessee. Mitch, you're also in East Tennessee, but you're on Central Time. Uh, and then we've That's got right. Mike, who's out on the West Coast. And uh, Tony, you're out somewhere over by Kansas City. Yep. We're all spread out around the country, but uh, really great to be here with you guys. I'm really thankful for the technology that we have here to do these live streams. And um, for those viewers who are watching right now, we have about 45 people that are tuned in right now. So thank you guys for spending your Thursday evening here with us on the Scale Trains YouTube channel. If you've been here before to these All About Scale Trains live streams, you'll know that we're going to dive into some of the characteristics of each and every prototype. We're going to be talking about the uh, second run of ES44 Jivos. And, you know, one of the things that we hear all the time, especially when we announced uh, this, this project, that a lot of people were kind of confused. Like, really? Another Jivo? You guys are doing another Jivo? And it kind of it kind of became a joke. It kind of became a meme among the rail fan community. I've seen it on Instagram where people will be like, another Jivo, you know, and uh, it's, it's really kind of turned into this fun thing. But I think as we get into this discussion, uh, you guys will see that this, this model is anything but another Jivo. It's, it's the definitive example in HO scale. And so that's why we've got Mike here tonight. And uh, Mike was the project. Well, he currently is the project lead. Um, but the project actually started out under the direction of uh, one of our other team members at Scale Trains, Charles Mylar. So, Mike, uh, if you would, give me a little bit of the backstory of the ES44 project. How did you guys decide on doing an ES44? What was the motivation there? Well, I think the, uh, the CSX private service units were something that was being talked about. And at that time, nobody had a late version ES44. There's others obviously on the market, but predominantly most of those are early versions of the, of the locomotive. And so to do an accurate version, there was a need for a late one. And we felt like there was an opportunity, even though for a lot of people, they would say, yeah, it's another Jivo. Um, you know, as we'll talk about later in this, in this broadcast, you're going to find out there's a lot more to G ES44s in particular, Jivos, than may meet the, meet the eye of the average model or rail fan. And so as we started looking at these and we realized that they were substantially different than the earlier production uh, versions, we felt like there was an opportunity there to be able to do a late version, do the pride and service units, and then also capture the other various road names on the later versions of GVOs. And while it is a GVO, it's still not run over what had already been, what was already out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh... You know, just from being at Scale Trains, I've, I'm, I'm approaching two years with the company. And since, been, since being with the company and being able to see the product development process firsthand, um, some of our viewers here tonight might have seen our, our documentary called How Model Trains Are Made. And it's really amazing from when you guys decide on a project to when it's actually delivered here in East Tennessee and then to when it actually ends up at, at our customers' doorsteps. It's a long process. But the research phase really takes a long time. What were some of the challenges that, that Charles and, and you yourself ran into when you first started out with this project? Well, again, you know, like, you, know, like you had mentioned, Charles Mylar, uh, one of our developers, was the gentleman who actually led, the, led the, the initial phase of this project. And what we've got here on the screen now is, is the spreadsheet, that, part of the spreadsheet that Charles had started to uh, start to lay out the various uh, variations and uh, various component changes that were happening on ES44s. Uh, we had basically broken them out into three different uh, groups, early production, mid-production, and late production. And you know, this spreadsheet has continued to grow as, we, as we've uh, found more and more things that are variables in the locomotive. So you know, building these spreadsheets, and we do one of these for every project. Paul, will do, Paul does these on the locomotives that he works on. And this is kind of a standard thing for us is to try to nail down exactly where things are changing, what things are changing, and trying to determine where those changes are happening. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, 
those changes don't necessarily happen from one delivery to the next. A lot of times those changes will happen mid delivery or a mid order. Let's call it a mid order. So railroad, a railroad orders, you know, a hundred locomotives to the first 35 may have a detail that is one way. And then for whatever reason, either the, the locomotive manufacturer, the railroad, or whatever says, Hey, we're going to change something. And then a subtle change happens. And so it's really critical to make sure that we nail that down. Um, you know, when we're picking road numbers, and so, uh, you know, that was, those are the, so what we've got here again is a spreadsheet that lays all of that out. So that's, that's probably the most uh, challenging thing at the front end is just collecting all the information to be, and get it into some kind of semblance of order so that you can, you can look at it. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different, uh, cells here in this spreadsheet document. And, you know, just the, the little minute details, like, uh, you know, one of the things not getting too far ahead of ourselves, but on the uh, 25th anniversary units, the BNSF ones, the the changes just alone in the PTC antenna array, um, it's really amazing. When, uh, several weeks ago, we were actually putting together a chart. We were, we were essentially taking this data here in this chart and putting it into something a little easier visually for our customers to see. And just to show everybody, just the differentiations in the BNSF versions. And uh, when I was looking at the PTC array, you know, I, I see these things all the time. I mean, we all do. They're the most common locomotives on the rails today. You don't really think about it, but then you look at the top of the of each locomotive, and it's like, well, man, that's a little bit different. That's, a, you know, this one has a long, short uh, PTC array, you know, and uh, various different manufacturers and things like that. It's, it's, uh, it's really amazing now. How do you guys go about finding this information? Like, do you guys actually go out in the field to take pictures or uh, do you guys have diagrams and things like that that help you with this kind of thing? No, it's probably, it's a combination of all of that. You know, I, I personally spend a lot of time trackside. I still enjoy rail fanning quite a bit. And so that's where I like to spend my time. So, you know, I'm out photographing and it's all about, the focus is about the next project we're working on or what we're currently working on, trying to collect specific photos uh, angles or things. It isn't just about rail fanning, trying to get that beautiful three quarter shot or what I like to call the artsy fartsy stuff. It's about, you know, we're, it's all about details about building the model. So my, my rail fanning is more geared towards that. And so it's a lot of, it's a lot of time track side. It's a lot of time beating the bush and, you know, trying to find drawings and prototype information. We're looking at, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time on the web trying to track down the manufacturers, you know, like you talked about the PTC stuff, there's several companies building PTC antenna farms. And, uh, you know, in particular, BNSF, for some reason, seems to struggle trying to figure out which one they like better. And so you're going to see when we talk about the uh, the 25th anniversary units in particular, you're going to see that there's there's a couple of different variations there. Uh, most of the roads seem to have kind of settled into some of the BNSF kind of, I think, likes to spread the wealth around a little bit. So. They, yeah. uh, they want to they want to share it with everybody but uh you know so again it is it, you know and what we're talking about when we talk about these variations the vast majority of these variations in this particular locomotive are focused on ge making changes in production not as much like a let's say as an example an sd40-2 whether you know you're talking about second third fourth fifth hand owner and there's been all kinds of things every every owner's changed on it we're talking about things that ge has changed over the years I, you know these were and some of the earliest production of these was early 2000s i think 2004 2005 um you know and they're still i think they were still as of recently still building uh tier four credit units i believe if my if uh, my understanding is correct so you're talking about 15 years worth of production or more you know uh you know and so when you're talking about a lot a long production span you know variations you know inevitably happen and so as you know as we go through that again it's all about trying to capture all of that and then trying to determine which railroads have which versions and you know how we can how we can dovetail if we do this version we can do you know with, with some minor changes we can do this railroad as well Mark, yeah I, yeah i assume that that's probably tougher on a contemporary model because when you think of like you mentioned the sd40-2 we all know the phase one, phase twos, and they get anti-climbers and, you know, there's things you know, but these things, as you say, 
it's like in process. So the target's kind of moving. You know, if you want to do a tunnel motor, it's like, well, they haven't built them in years. Here's every, it's a static thing, but boy, this is kind of a moving target to yep. keep up with. Yeah. Yeah. And there, 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 you know, there were some subtle changes that happened in, uh, that we had noticed in the ET 44s that also translates back over to the ES 44s. Uh, here, the latest, some of the latest production, both on the ET and the ES 44s. Uh, GE for some reason decided to go to change the end the end handrails. They kind of settled in what we call the narrow version uh, a handrails. Well, if you look at some of the late BNSF, both ET 44s and ES 44s, and some of the Canadian units that we're doing, you know, there was a small batch that had wide handrails, um, and then subsequent to that, production has gone back to the narrow handrail again, and so there is a finite group of number road numbers. In a, in a larger series or a larger delivery that are different from everything on both sides of them. Hmm. You know, and so we've got those kind of things. And so we really got to, you know, this is the reason why we're always chasing down more photos, trying to get, you know, document each road number because of the level of detail that we want to go after. We're trying to make sure that we, you know, have the exact right road numbers and with the right, right combination of details. When yeah. you mentioned the PTCs on those BNSF units changing, does that come from like General Electric? Is that put on in like Fort Worth or does do the individual railroad, you say how they source these things. So is that well, not like they don't get them that way? They put it on. Does How does that work? That it well, on the BNSF way? units in particular, again, and, and focusing in on the 25th anniversary units just for a moment, uh, those units were all early production GIVOs, which is a whole other subset of this a little We'll touch in, I think, a little bit later in this in the commentary here. Uh, but they were delivered with a certain type of antenna arrangement, PTC and other related stuff. Subsequent to that, new, better, different stuff has been has, has been introduced. And so BNSF has gone back in and installed new versions of antennas on them. And so the some of the original stuff is there, some of it's gone unit for unit. They change on how they either what they did and didn't what they did or did not leave on the cab roof, and then what they did or didn't add to the add to the cab roof. <laughs> wow. And so you know there there are there's multiple versions, and um, you know and so again they are you know those ones in particular are, are unique because of the fact the NSF has a tendency appears to have a tendency to like to buy PTC you know antennas from various roads, coupled with. They when they were stripping off the original stuff, they you know they some of them got had more stuff removed than others, and then when they added, they you know so it's a it's a common it's a it's a combination of what's going on there. Wow. Yeah, it's uh it really is amazing, and you know I've noticed some things trackside that I never would have picked up on before. Um, you know when you see this stuff every single day, you kind of kind of get numb to it all you don't really notice the the small minute details all the time mitch uh you have experience working <laughs> on the prototype so you've you've got about 10 years of working under on the railroad under your belt is that true yes yeah, just a little bit more but yeah that's pretty close so about a decade working on the rails and uh, i know i've had some conversations with you uh you know on the phone and things like that and you said that the uh, the NS8000 series locomotives are your favorite locomotives to work on. Why is that? Well, that's a, a few different things on the 8000s. I mean, from a conductor standpoint and from, I guess you would say, opinions of engineers with the 8000 series, the pulling, the quietness inside the cab is, which nowadays is a really big deal. The dynamic the reliability of the 8,000 series, 90% of, I, I guess you would, if you would take a poll, you would feel, you would hear less people complaints about those than you would actually the new rebuilds. Really? So with my opinion, the 8,000 series are more reliable, the comfortability as far, you know, that doesn't matter as far as the company wise, you know, but the reliability, the dynamic, they're going down the track with them, you know, the tonnage that you can pull behind one of them. That's my favorite as far as where I work. But my favorite would be the CSX style as far as the model produced. And why is that? What's the key differences between the CSX and the NS, for example? <laughs> steerable trucks. I like the look of the steerable trucks. 
Is there a notable the difference trucks. between performance of the regular trucks and the steerable trucks? Well, the steerable trucks, if, well, I mean, different class ones, you know, your track work's going to be different on, depending on what territory you run on to. But for say you have a North say A91, you got a straight stretch of tracks for 60 miles, and you take a CSX locomotive straight stretch of track for 60 miles. You're both run, you say you take each one, you run 60 mile an hour. The steerable trucks, you'll get more left to right, side to side motion for what they're designed for with the slack in them than you would with, I guess, you would the high end trucks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just, the look of the steerable trucks is what it does for me. I, I, I like those. Yeah. And the, with the low number boards. Now, the, uh, the BNSF locomotives, I know some of them have the C4 trucks. Have you had yes. experience running? Do you like those or not so much from an operating standpoint? Well, nowadays with the Precision Railroad and PSR, you don't get too much, depending on your territory. Also, foreign locomotives. On our side, I work from Chattanooga to Burnside, Kentucky on a CNOTP, and I also work Chattanooga Yard. Well, we don't nowadays we don't get as much but you're starting to see a little bit here lately so i can't really give a good opinion as far as a c4 truck style on how they ride or how they operate so that's kind of you know that's out of my talk right there yeah I've, I've heard i've heard mixed reviews some people like them and some people don't um but you know what about the cn versions I, i've heard that they also have hot plates on, on the inside and uh some amenities that other locomotives don't have uh i, I know some <laughs> I know some crews really like getting CN power because of that. Well, the newer CN power, yes. Uh, now on the Norfolk Southern versions of the G of the ES44 ACs, the conductor seat, and you also, I guess, what you would call back then the fireman seat. There's three seats in the cab. It's directly behind the conductor seat, and of course, you got your engineer seat. And we have what you call a booster seat that sits right by. I guess it'll be right by the the uh, cabinet behind the engineer. On the Canadian versions, the seat is in the middle of the cab, and then you have a conductor seat on that side also. Behind the conductor seat, you have a hot plate, which is two little. You know, some of them have two eyes, some of them have one, and you know you can warm up your can of beanie weenies or whatever you have available. And of course, <laughs> every one of them have every one of them have refrigerators, but that's the least. I guess you would say maintenance part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I've heard from quite a few different people, you know, the, the commentary is that the, the Jeevos are a lot more quiet than, than a lot of the locomotives, just like what you said. And I think that's one of the key things, you know, you're out on the road and, and just being able to, you know, run your train, being able to hear the radio clearly, being able to hear your engineer clearly, um, being able to have that kind of communication is it's a really big deal especially in this day and age and so you know the 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 rebuilt locomotives like you were saying like the ac44 c6ms you said that those are a little louder than than the the jivos is that just because the cabs aren't isolated well they're they're uh, the guy designed that designed those cabs if i'm not mistaken was not in partner but was somehow in tie with the person that designed the Avril cab. Now, the new cabs on the rebuilds are somewhat supposed to say, I guess you would say, isolated. Mm -hmm. and, and all it is is it's just an overhauled locomotive with the same prime mover and everything, so they don't have to require the Tier 4 emissions. Imagine sitting in a Porter John with an empty can. You throw a couple coins in it, and you shake it really loud. <laughs> The back wall yeah. on that thing. I mean, and don't get me wrong; they're nice. You know, when they when they get down, you're going upside the mountain. You're ten mile an hour with a lot of tonnage. You know, they dig down and they grind and they go. But everything in that cab will shake and fall off. Mm -hmm. so, Man, but I mean, they're great. Yeah, you know, they, they ride nice and they're designed for what Norfolk Southern wants them to use. What, what you know, what they use them for. And of course, it beats on buying a brand new one. Oh yeah, the, I think I read somewhere that the cost savings was like, I don't know, like a third the cost of a brand new locomotive. So I mean, it makes sense that they're rebuilding them. 
But uh, it, yeah. it's cool, though. And, you know, Mike, you, you and I were talking earlier um, on the phone about how, you know, the ES44s, they've been around for, I mean, they've been making them for, for 20, about 20 years, give or take, about 15, actually. And, um, you know, the, just from the early versions to the late versions, there's so much variety and, and differations there. Um, but, you know, it's it's really a locomotive that even though it's it's the, the earlier versions are getting some age to them, they really are, are great performers. It seems like crews really like them. But you see them on the rails. They're, they're virtually on every every train today. And I think when we were putting some of our marketing materials together for this project, I read somewhere that the uh, ES44, there are actually more ES44s produced than the SD40-2 or really any other locomotive. Is, is that correct? I'm pretty sure that's that's the case. I would suspect that it very well could be. I don't know. I don't know for sure. But again, you know, when you look at a, a 40-2, uh, SC40-2 uh, traffic production started in 72 and ended in 84. Um, you know, we, you know, the, the ES44 has been going a lot longer. Granted, not as many roads out there as there were when 40-2s were being built. But I'll tell you, you know, you, uh, everybody's got them and they got a ton of them. So, you know, it just, it, I would not be surprised if there were, if there were substantially more. Again, you know, when you look at the variations, it sure seems like it. Well, and one of the things too is just the amount of parts, you know, just as far as tooling goes, the amount of parts that we actually had to create for the tooling. Um, it's really mesmerizing. When, when I was, uh, when I was in at our factory, I was able to see the copper electrodes that were being used to make the ES44. And um, for those of, of you who are watching, we've got about 130 viewers. Um, you know, for those of you that have seen our video, how model trains are made, um, we showed a little bit of footage of the electrodes that were used to make the ES44s. Now, that video was shot at our factory in November of 2019. So we're talking well over a year and a half ago. Um, that they were just starting to cut tooling for the ES44 project. So, and we delivered the the first um, run of ES44s in, the, in this spring earlier this year. So, um, it took well over a year, about 14, 15 months from the time we started putting the tooling together, and then we made the announcement in August, late August of uh, 2020. So, but prior to the announcement, uh, a good oh man, a good eight, nine months before the announcement, that's when we started cutting tooling. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Like, you know, there's a lot of projects that we have in development right now. People ask us all the time, you know, what about a four axle? What about a steam locomotive? And, you know, when we tell people like, yeah, those locomotives are, are they're on the drawing board, they're, they're being done right now. These projects take years and years um, to come to market. So even though we might not have said anything about it, we, we've already been working on projects long, long, long in the past. So the ES44 has been a project that's been a long time coming. And what really accelerated this project, Mike, was our relationship with CSX. When, when we discovered that CSX was going to be producing this special fleet of locomotives called Pride and Service, um, it's for an employee program of veterans um, who work for the railroad and their families. And it was really cool when we first heard about this project. And before we get into talking about Pride and Service, I just want to play a quick little clip here that we've created uh, to, to kind of tell you guys a little bit about our Pride and Service locomotive. So without further ado, here's this little clip. So Pride and Service, it was a really exciting project for us. And, and like I said, when we, when we first heard about the Pride and Service locomotives, that really kind of was the acceleration point for this project. So Mike, why don't you tell me a little bit about the Pride and Service project? When, when you first heard about these locomotives, um, just as, as a patriotic American, what, what did you think when you first found out about this project? Well, I was obviously excited about it from the standpoint, I think it's, you know, uh, you know our first responders, our military, uh, all of these people don't get enough credit for what they do for for us, and and 
you know, I think a lot of what they do is taken for granted. So I, I was uh, thrilled to have an opportunity to be involved in, in producing the models. Um, you know, when we first saw the prototypes, I was, I was starting to get a little concerned in the context of the complexity of the decoration. They really, I got to say, they went all out. I mean, the, the, low, the prototypes look great. I think the models that we did look, all, look equally as good, but it was uh, quite a challenging project, you know, not just the tooling, but the whole decoration. And we, quite frankly, we weren't quite sure if our factory was going to be able to, to replicate uh, a lot of what was going on there. Yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna while we're while we're talking here, I'm gonna put up a quick little video clip um, showing some more footage of the locomotives running around on uh, Tim Garland's amazing layout. But uh, one of the things that was really cool about this project is that we were able to work directly with CSX on this project, and uh, you know CSX has been really an amazing Class One partner. Um, it really for us all began with the CSX Spirit of Ravenna Tier Four Jivo. Um, when that came together, I was a volunteer at Kentucky Steam. That's actually how I got connected with you guys at Scale Trains. And, you know, it was really, really a touching thing for me as part of a volunteer organization to learn about Scale Trains, uh, a manufacturer that really believes in giving back to preservation. And so that, that relationship started with the, with the Spirit of Ravenna locomotive. We um, got in touch with CSX and we put Scale Trains in touch with CSX and we were able to actually provide scale trains with the actual logo that was on the spirit of Ravenna 3440 locomotive. And from that point on through Kentucky steam, that's really how we were able to develop our, our partnership with CSX. And when it came to the design of the pride and service locomotives, um, one of the key players in that project was Tyler Harden. Uh, Tyler Harden is an incredibly talented graphic artist. Uh, from Georgetown, Kentucky. Tyler has been a lifelong rail fan, and he has designed numerous locomotive paint schemes for CSX and other railroads. He's designed logos for various different organizations, short lines, nonprofits, you name it. And through Tyler's uh, volunteer work at Kentucky Steam, um, he was able to get in, in touch with the folks at CSX and when this pride and service project started to develop, I believe they started working on this project around 2018, early 2018. And uh, the first locomotives were unveiled in uh, 2019. And, you know, Tyler, his talent, you can just see his talent in all of these paint schemes. And another really cool thing about Tyler is he was the mastermind behind the, the CSX office car paint scheme, the B&O inspired paint scheme. So pretty much any special paint scheme that CSX has come out with in the last year and a half um, has been done by Tyler Harden. And uh, Tyler was really a big player in the Pride and Service project. He, along with CSX, provided us with official diagrams to make these locomotives. We were able to make sure that we got all of our dimensions correct, that all the logos were the correct size and everything. And we also worked with the Huntington Locomotive Shop so, and it's really, really cool because as you know, you know, one of our core values as a company is to give back. And, you know, we gave to uh, various different museums with the Big Blow Turbine Project, with the Spirit of Ravenna Project. We, we helped contribute to Kentucky Steam. But CSX had a special request for the Pride and Service Project. They asked us to make a donation to the organizations that they're supporting. And, it's just really cool to be a part of something like that. Our, our company is just really blessed um, to be able to give back to those who give the ultimate sacrifice, both here um, domestically and abroad. And, you know, there's a, there's a locomotive here for everyone. There, they, you know, there's a police and first responders locomotive. And then of course our armed forces and CSX just did an incredible job giving each locomotive and uh, a distinct identity. So we're honored in, uh, you know, it really is truly a privilege to be part of the Pride and Service program. So I'd like to say thank you to CSX for allowing us to be part of that. And uh, man, we just we just wish you guys uh, the best of luck. And uh, it's really great to see a company in this in this day and age, the size of CSX uh, to give back to nonprofits and to their employees, too. So big, uh, big props to CSX. But anyway, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting when the um, CSX 3194, the police unit was unveiled. It actually had red and blue dish lights. And, you know, the, the CSX 
uh, folks down there in Huntington, West Virginia, they've got a good sense of humor. They unveiled the locomotive with smoke machines. And let me let me get some audio here so I don't hear my myself talking twice. Um, but they actually unveiled the locomotive with smoke machines, and they had the uh, the show from the the show Cops, the theme song uh, "Bad Boys" playing in the background. As the locomotive rolled out of the shop for the first time. I just thought that was hilarious. But uh, that's one of the things that we did with our first run of uh, Pride and Service locomotives, Mike. How did you feel about doing blue and red dish lights? <laughs> I, I thought it was a great touch. I, I really liked it. Um, again, I just I thought they went all out and and uh, you know they couldn't have done a better job with all three of those locomotives in the in the in what they did for the decoration. I thought they I thought they looked good. They represented well. Um, they were just really well done. Yeah, they really were. And um, if I if I remember correctly, there was kind of a fun fun story. <laughs> so CSX actually invited us to be part of that event. And Shane went up there to actually take photos for our product development team. And so Mike, and you feel free to, to chime in on this, but Shane submitted all of the photos and PD was like, okay, well, we've got blue and red ditch lights. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, I think Shane told me at one point that you had no idea that there was a clear dish light version. And so we just went right ahead and started doing blue and red. No, well, yeah. I mean, you know, again, you know, I'm out here on the West Coast. I have yet to see these things in person. All the photos that were supplied to us showed red and blue ditch lights. So we pressed ahead with red and blue ditch lights. And so, uh, you know, the first run obviously was that way because of that. But uh, subsequent to that, uh, you know, Shane had alerted us to the fact that they uh, they actually took the lenses out and put the uh, put clear lenses in. But again, you know, we work from photos. And if that's the way the photos are, that's the way the model's going to be. And that's just, you know, that's how we do stuff. And so it is, uh, you know, if you're going to you know, need to make sure that the photos are accurate and they got the kind of information that we want, because that's what you're going to get. Oh, yeah. Photos are critical. And, you know, I know that you've said it before in the How Model Trains Are Made video, but rail fans, a lot of times when we have folks that uh, say, hey, you guys should make this locomotive, you should make that locomotive, um, they'll send us photos, but they won't be the kind of photos that we really need for our product development team to research a project. And so if you guys have photos and you and there's a particular model that you'd like to, to see us make, make sure you send us detail shots. You know, roster shots are great, but we need to be able to see the cab roof lines. We need to be able to see the warning labels. We need to be able to see what kind of snow plow that they have or what kind of number boards they have. Different things like that. Um, those detail shots make a world of a difference. So what we've got on screen right now, guys, is a video by my friend Logan Allen. His, uh, his YouTube channel is uh, SCL3618. He's got a lot of really great model railroading videos. And uh, about a couple months ago, he got a phone call from a friend of his saying, hey, the pride and service units are coming to town. And by the way, uh, they're leading. And so he took the liberty to take his uh, HO scale models and uh, set them up out in front of the train going by. So uh, he, he actually has, I think, a couple of those Two of those models are ours, and there's one MTH model in there. But uh, it was really cool being able to see the prototype uh, in Logan's video at, next to the model. So very, very cool. All right. So, Mike, another locomotive uh, that we talked about big time as a uh, as a big part of the ES44 project is, of course, the BNSF 25th anniversary units. So, you know, originally when we started out on this project, you mentioned earlier that we were going to focus on the late version ES44s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you you can speak a lot more to that backstory. So tell me a little bit about the 25th anniversary. How did that whole thing come about? Well, you know, you know you're right. As, as we talked about when Charles, you know, started this project for us, you know, the plan was is that, well, there's other, ver you know, there's other early versions out there. So we're just going to kind of sidestep those, knowing all of the variations that are available. Um, and so we decided, OK, we'll focus on the late ones. Well, then we had gotten we had gotten word that BNSF was looking at doing these 25th anniversary units. And so we had we were you know talking with them and, and uh, trying to trying to get them to nail down exactly what the plan was and so we had a had a really good working relationship with them uh you know they had determined you know what early on that they wanted to do acs and not c4s or or dcs they really seemed to like the ac units 
And so we uh, we went ahead and supplied them some road number series, you know, and said, okay, you know, these are the these are the BNSF AC units that we can do, which were all later production units. And they went through and decided, no, nah, those aren't the ones we're going to do. Uh, they they chose them, but they chose all early production units, and you know, which was a, made it a challenge for us understand understanding why they did it. Obviously, they picked the, the units that were the oldest ones and the ones that. We're not. Look, we're looking a little more worn from all the years of running. Um, I can completely understand why they chose the ones they did, but it it really threw a threw a real challenge at us because we had no tooling. You know the right. uh, the ES forty fours that we've got again are very different than the uh, than the than the uh, the early ones, or at least the original tooling that we had. And so we kind of had to start all over. And so we worked. You know, again, worked with with the spreadsheet that Charles initially pulled together for us. And then kind of extrapolated from there, um, you know. And at this point is, you know, was when I kind of, kind of came in and took this, uh, these early production units, kind of under my wing as a project. And uh, you know, I'll tell you, the the ten BNSF units, every one of them is different from every other one. They uh, they pulled them from one. What is it? One. Two, and they pulled them from seven different deliveries. And even in, even in that in those seven deliveries, there are no two units that are exactly the same. When you That's look incredible. At, when you look at the when you look at paint, the way they're painted, when you look at the way they're detailed, uh, again, this is where the PTC confusion comes in, or the the PTC challenge. I guess is probably a better way to describe it. Um, there's a couple of them that have got horns where that have been uh, disassembled and cleaned at some point in time. And when they reassemble them, they didn't put the trumpets back in the original configuration. So while they're all uh, K5 horns, the trumpets are not, all, not all of them have the trumpets in the original configuration. Um, again, variations in the, in the, uh, in the PTC, uh, the first unit, the uh, 58, what was the lowest one? 50, 58, 25, 58, 28. Um, you know, that was the first one we started doing artwork on and we started our, had our artists working on the artwork for that particular one and we're laying all the stripes on the model and the stripes aren't landing on the model the, where they should compare to the prototype photos. Well, as we started looking at them and looking at this unit in particular, there's a misalignment between the stripes on the hood and the, on the cab and the battery boxes. And, wow. it, and it's a, you know, it's something subtle, but it does have it has an effect on when we were trying to lay the strike that they would the stripes would line up correctly on the cab, but they wouldn't line up correctly on the body. And so there's a, there's actually a transition and in, in a elevation change on the stripes between the, between the body uh, and between the cab and the and the uh, the battery boxes. And so um, again, uh, you know, between that. And some of the other things that, that are changing on them, um, it was you know we had that problem plus the fact that they are all early units, which again none of our none of our contemporary none of the tooling that we had was going to work short of the mechanism, and so we basically it was almost a whole new project from the ground up just to get the the BNSF units, and then we added a couple of other road names uh, for early units that were that were able to do as well, but we had to fast track the tooling, we had to fast track everything to get these delivered in a timely fashion. So it was quite a, uh, it was quite an adventure and, and collecting photos was a real challenge because they were just, they were just out there. Um, and so we had, you know, there weren't a lot of photographs for a lot of them. Um, and so we really had to get out and, and uh, track them down. So we had a lot of people that were helping us with that and were able to pull together what we needed, but it was, uh, it was, it was one of our more challenging projects, especially with the timeline that we had to work within. Oh yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, it's well, just really cut in. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I got one question specifically, and I would like to know, and I've had quite a few people ask, who are, I know you guys, you know, have the design team and everything like that. On scale trains, I would like to commend them, and a lot of people I've heard this too, is removing the shell, especially with the Jeevos. When you take the shell off, you have nothing connected. You mm -hmm. can completely remove it. Was that one particular person's idea on that design, or is that something that, that people that get design actually with? came from our factory? It was something that we specified. We didn't give them any specifics on how to get it done, but the, our, our the factory and our engineering team over in China were the ones that came up with the with the way to facilitate that. 
Um, you know, that's obviously been that's obviously been a problem for a lot of manufacturers over the years. And you know, with all the lights and everything that you've got in there, especially with ditch lights and such, um, the 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 uh, options are not. There's not a long list of options to be able to to do that. But it was something. You know, as you know, us being modelers, we understand that problem and that challenge. And so that was that was something that we posed to our engineering team, and they were the they were the ones that came back with the idea of doing it the way we do it. So. Well, and even with the ditch lights, when you open up the shell, you have actually, you have, you do not have the light to light pipes. Mm -hmm. I guess you would say fiber optic tube, and you have surface yep. mount ditch lights. Yep. And it has the little bronze connector, which I thought was a great idea because you don't have the fiber optic tube, but your ditch lights are a lot different than your headlight and everything. It's just, I commend scale trains or even, you know, whoever come up with the idea that that was really great to be able to remove the shell and not have nothing else in the way disconnecting wires soldering and all that mm -hmm. i you know, i agree i think that's fantastic the that kind of is a modern design that's spreading through the hobby and there's nothing better than that because i take them apart all the time for the magazine reviews more than probably a lot of folks do and some of them are a real <laughs> challenge but those come apart so nice yeah well if you guys see here there are some photos that uh mike mike did you snap these yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, this is, these this are is, some of the these are some of the detailed photos that that Mike took, and and this is what we're talking about. So, um, you know, when you guys suggest various different models, and you're like, hey, we we've got pictures of X, Y, and Z model. Can you make this? Um, these are the kind of photos that we're looking for. We're looking for photos where you know high resolution. You're zoomed in on the on the features of the locomotive. If if you can walk around all sides of it, or maybe if you have a drone or something that you know maybe you're standing on a bridge look at that you know you can very very easily see the warning labels and the fuel uh, no, and notice the yellow, notice the yellow stripes going across that box the capacitor box you notice they're not straight oh yeah that's true that and you know if you'll in, in a couple of the other shots and this is the this is the unit that had the misalignment on the stripes and you can see how the you know these these stripes here in the middle are not are not straight and back on the back on the hood doors are actually higher than they are on the inverter cabinet. That's incredible. See, these are things that I would just never notice, but you know, it's uh, that's why I'm not in product development. <laughs> <laughs> it it really is amazing though. Like if you guys look at that matrix that we showed earlier, you know, we're talking hundreds, if not over a thousand different cells with all the different detail parts. You know, and, and as you can see here, Mike took, I don't know, 50, 60 photos of this locomotive. But these are the kind of photos that we need. I see here uh, Tony sharing his screen. Let me uh, revert over here to Tony's screen so you can see some of the photos that uh, that Tony's sharing. There's some more beautiful detailed shots. But, you know, it's really hard to come across product photography like this. I'll give I'll give one example. There's a, a locomotive out there, um, the C39-8. And... It's really interesting because we know that at least one CSX C39 was painted in the YN3 paint scheme in the in the, around 2004. And that locomotive wore that paint scheme for maybe six months before it was retired. And we only have, actually no, we have two photos of that locomotive, but they're both taken from the conductor side of the locomotive. So unfortunately, until we have better photography, that's just a locomotive that we can't make at the rivet counter level without guessing, you know, and that's one of our principles as a company. When it comes to the rivet counter line, we want it to have that fidelity. You know, you'd be able to take it out of the box and everything be correct on it. You know, and of course we're human, we're not perfect, but we try our best to be as perfect as we can. And these photos just kind of give you guys an idea of the level of detail that our product development team goes to with each road number. So, Mike, how many of the um, 25th anniversary units are there? Were there 10? I can't remember. There's 10, yeah. So 10 locomotives, each from a different... Uh, you seven, know, seven, seven, different seven different production runs and, and yeah. 10, in 10 units. And again, all 10 are different. Wow. Whether, so, you know, whether it's physical details, paint and lettering, uh, you know, or, or a combination of the two. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's really daunting when you begin to dive into into all the differences and you know it's just really cool 
to be able to go and see all the work that you guys have done behind the scenes. Um, here's another comment here from Chili Sub Customs. As someone who models the Transcon, the late ES40DC is something that we need. I have two ES44C4s and cut them to have the correct dynamic braking for a late DC. So, Mike, you know, we're going to get into um, some question and answer session here in a little bit. But, um, you know, I'm sure that we've looked at all these various different versions of the DC and AC BNSF GBOs. Yep. Yeah. And there's the, yeah, obviously, you know, we're, we're just getting started and there are, we've got, Plenty to do. We've got, you know, and obviously BNSS probably one of the bigger challenger challenges because they've got ACs, DCs, C4s, and they've been buying them since the early 2000s. So there's a there's a lot of subtle variations, and we we're going to be able to capture pretty good pretty good collection of those over time. Bradley Ogden asks, will I will we bring out any ES44 ACs in the Canadian National City Rail Gray? Now, Mike, I don't know. Have you seen pictures of those yet? No, I have not. So I With guess. Patch. Yeah, have you seen those, Mitch? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I've seen pictures of them. Yeah, so I guess uh, Canadian National bought some uh, City Rail Jevos, and they they're patched out for CN, but they still are in the City Rail scheme. So we'll have to look at those. We are doing City Rail in this run of ES44, yep. so I'm sure uh, in the future that'll be a possibility. Um, more heritage units in the ES44s too in the future. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is a cool question. Um, I don't want to butcher your name, so forgive me if I get it wrong. But um, Unsi Nary Narynin, um, he asks now a big question though. All the research that goes into the differences of the individual locomotive road numbers is the same care taken for freight wagons. I'm assuming that he's out in Europe. Um, and, and Mike. Does the product development team take the, the same steps as, as you would with a locomotive at, into freight cars? Obviously, on, on the River Counter product, yeah. Uh, maybe not quite to the same level. There are going to be some areas where, where we're going to, uh, you know, things like uh, capacity data and stuff. We may not, depending on the project, we may not do every one of them exactly to the car because those vary. You know, part of the problem also is, you know, is quite frankly, it's, you know, it's a, you know, keeping we need to keep in mind this is we're in a business as well. As much as we're hobbyists and enthusiasts, it is a business, and so we've got to find that balance. We got to we got we there's a very fine tightrope that we've got to walk. Uh, you know, between making those good business decisions and and the passion that we have for this hobby and the industry. So you know, again, not trying to make excuses, but for the most part, rivet counter stuff, uh, freight cars are going to be at a comparable level. Um, though there will we you know we will take some liberty. Uh, uh, on some of the smaller data issues and things like that. Gotcha. Yeah. And, you know, I know that you guys have said it um, to me, you know, just in our day-to-day -day work, but freight cars are much easier than locomotives. It, typically, yes. There's, you know, and uh, obviously just from the standpoint of they don't, have, you know, there's, you don't have a complete mechanism to worry about. There's no, typically no electronics to be concerned about. So yes, freight cars, you know, for the most part are, are simpler. So we've got a, a graphic on the homepage of the scaletrains.com site. And uh, as you can see, we're doing the Norfolk Southern Heritage units. We're also doing Ferromex, two different versions for Ferromex, at least as far as paint schemes goes. City Rail, a lot of rail fans like to call them credit card Jeevos because Citibank owns their own railroad lead division. And then, of course, you've got Union Pacific. We're doing several different versions for Union Pacific, including the GE 5000 series locomotive. We've got two different versions of Canadian Pacific. We've got a really neat version that we're actually going to offer. Let me uh, let me do a little bit of navigating. Tony, I don't know if you've got any pictures of those in your archive, but uh, one of the one of the locomotives that we're offering um, for CN, we're actually going to do or not CN, excuse me, CP. Well, you know, I could just click on the graphic. It would take me right there. There we go. Um, we're doing two different versions for CP. And one of the versions that we're doing is uh, locomotive number 8939. And this locomotive is really cool. Uh, I don't think it's going to let me zoom in any further on that. But they actually have a special crest that's on the side of this locomotive. And um, Lord Strathcona, he was the guy that actually drove the Golden Spike into the Canadian Pacific Transcontinental Railroad. 
1885. He was also one of the founders of Canadian Pacific and became a board of, of director member and um, stayed with the railroad for the remainder of his life uh, all the way up until the 19 teens. He formed a private military brigade of Canadian special marksmen. So um, we're talking mounted police, um, hunters, very you know skilled marksmen. And they assembled a regiment of, uh, of soldiers to go overseas and fight alongside the British Empire in the South African War. And so ever since then, the Strathconas have been a really important part of Canadian military history. And I never knew this um, about Canadian Pacific, but after diving into the history of this locomotive, it's really cool. And I actually was being somebody that grew up not too far from Detroit, I used to see Canadian Pacific power all the time running from uh, Detroit down to Butler, Indiana. So I did, I picked up a couple of uh, CP Jeevos and I'm being able to run those um, later next year, but just really cool. It's the little details and the paint scheme variations that we offer that really set our ES44s apart. And um, again, none of it would really be possible without, without photography from you guys. So as we're scrolling here on the, on the home page, you guys can see that we're offering the Norfolk Southern hair units. We're doing original Norfolk Southern. Um, you know, some of you might not know the history, but NS was actually a short line in North Carolina that the Southern Railway bought out in the 70s. Um, the original paint scheme that, that NS applied to their locomotives in the 40s and 50s was this beautiful red and yellow scheme. Um, so that's what Norfolk Southern chose for their, for their original NS heritage unit. Then, of course, we've got the uh, the Interstate Heritage Unit, as a lot of rail fans call it, the Cream Sickle. And then we've got, uh, uh, I'm a New York Central guy, so it's my least favorite Heritage Unit, but we've got the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, still, beautiful model. I'm just a New York Central guy. And then uh, we've got the Southern Railway, which is actually my favorite Heritage Unit. And one of the cool things about the Southern Railway Unit, I've got we got some pictures here that we'll uh, we'll share. Tony's got his screen up. I'll switch over to uh, to Tony's screen. Man, Tony, that thing looks beautiful right there. I'm guessing that's at Spencer. That is. That's one of Kevin Udaley's shots. He was at the North Carolina event. And Mike, I, I think you can tell us on this group. I remember if somebody says, "Oh, they're running those again." That's not the case. This, now this is the brand new version of that mm -hmm. uh, but what this is what 2007 maybe i think is when i believe started. so yeah yeah it's hard to, it's hard to believe these are that uh, that old they don't seem like they would be but now what you're doing this time though for those four roads that drayton mentioned the details are different or yeah, all, yeah we're, we're doing them we're doing in the in contemporary they've all got ptc ptc antennas so again same kind of the situation as we talked about with the bnsf these are old enough that they were prior to the contemporary PTC systems. Mm -hmm. And so we they've all been retrofitted with the big cabinets. And so we went ahead and, and uh, decided that, you know, again, because there's other other models out there, uh, you know, in, in the in the earlier variant of these, we decided to do them as they are now. Mm -hmm. So the guys that want to run them, you know, as a contemporary model today will be able to do that. And isn't so the, that's Drayton the Southern Herald has changed or something on this too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I was going to jump in there. So um, the photos that you have there, um, Tony, were taken at Spencer in 2012. So I believe like what Mike, you and Mike were saying, these locomotives were new in 2007, 2008-ish. But uh, NS took these locomotives and then they, they essentially brought them in and repainted them and took care of them and all that and put the heritage schemes on them. And um, when, when 8099 was first painted, it was painted here in uh, Chattanooga at the Butts Yard. Um, and it was really kind of cool because that was Southern Railway's main paint shop for years and years and years. So for those guys, a lot of those guys started out with the Southern. They were getting to paint a Southern Railway locomotive again. But because Southern Railway is a fallen flag and it hasn't been around it at that point, it hadn't been around for 30 years, the guys basically couldn't didn't have any decals on hand. So they found a high-resolution Southern Railway logo or as some persnickety modelers call it, a monogram. They took this monogram and Southern Railway, when they when they uh, originally had their logo, the, the, the circle monogram, it said, the Southern Railway serves the South. 
And that was applied to the uh, F units and the E units. And then in the 60s, as a cost-cutting measure, Southern Railway got away from using their heralds, their monograms. And um, it wasn't until Graham Clater um, became the president of Southern Railway in 1969, and they started applying logos back on the locomotive. Well, they added a bar to the bottom of the logo, and it says, look ahead, look south. So back in the 40s and 50s, it didn't have that bar. But what they did is instead of it saying the Southern Railway, it just said Southern Railway serves the South. And then on top of what they call the rail, the little bar at the bottom, it just said, look ahead, look south. So when the Chattanooga paint shop guys, I'm going to, I'm going to switch over here to my screen so you guys can see the, the modern version of the uh, 8099. When the Southern Railway guys got together at the Chattanooga paint shop, they found a high res logo. They printed it off, made decals, and just slapped it on the front of the locomotive. Well, the, the, the logo was technically not historically correct. And so, um, you know, while it looked beautiful and while Norfolk Southern did a really great job, it technically, if you're a rivet counter, wasn't correct. And so the Southern Railway guys, uh, some of you might know Casey Thomason. He, is, uh, he was Norfolk Southern's company photographer, and he still does some photography work for them. He's a big Southern Railway fan. And so Casey, along with uh, some other NS employees, in November of 2020, there was a special event at the Southeastern Railway Museum in Duluth, Georgia. And at this event, they actually went and replaced the original logo that was applied to the heritage unit. You can see it here. I'll try to, uh, I don't know if it'll let me, uh, there you go. Um, they, this was the original logo, and as you can see there, it says, The Southern serves the South. Well, this is the correct version of the logo. It just says, Southern Railway serves the South. So when when the locomotive was at this special event in Duluth, they actually, prior to the locomotive arriving at Duluth, uh, in, in Minyard, they actually replaced the lettering on the side of the locomotive, and then they also um, touched up the, lo the logos. And what was really cool, because Southern Railway had logos on the long hood of their locomotives toward the end. And so since this ES44 is meant to represent Southern Railway's look back in the you know, late 70s, early 80s, uh, even though they didn't use this uh, crescent green scheme, uh, they just to add a logo to the long hood end. And, as you can see here on Tony's screen, this is when it was originally painted. So um, Casey Thomason and uh, another prolific modeler, Stephen Holmes, he got in touch with us and said, hey, guys, you know, on those heritage units, are you guys going to make sure the Southern Railway logo is accurate on your version with PTC? And I was like, uh, pretty sure it is accurate. And so they're like, check the artwork and, and make sure. So I went and looked at the artwork and they sent us these pictures and lo and behold, our artwork was actually correct. All we needed to do was add this logo to the long hood so it would be correct because the logo on the front wouldn't have been correct. It's kind of confusing, but anyway, so last minute, this was like, I don't know, a month or two ago, um, we, we, at the marketing department got in touch with PD and we're like, Hey guys, like we got to make sure we get this right. So and that's the cool thing about the NS heritage units that we're offering. Uh, as far as I am aware, there are no other NS heritage units on the market right now with PTC. And so being able to do that, um, it's really, really cool. So if, if you're one of the folks that really like Southern Railway, like I do, uh, it's really cool to know that you're going to be having the absolute most modern version of the locomotive. And this is in our Time to Model article. This was the original Southern Railway Heritage Unit. Um, this was uh, a locomotive that was painted special by the Chattanooga Boys in uh, 1994 to commemorate Southern Railway's or not bicentennial, centennial. I'm so used to saying bicentennial because of all the all the 1776 locomotives we've been doing, but. Uh, Anyway, so that was the original Southern Heritage Unit. But, uh, you know, it's it's just those little details that make a real big difference. And, again, it all goes back to photography. You know, we are rivet counters, but we're not perfect. And so when we have folks that send us detail photos like this, we can go in and make modifications to our artwork before we 
you know, send the locomotives to production. So uh, we were blessed to have that uh, that photography there from Casey and, and Steven. Um, let me go back out. I didn't mean to go to that tab. Let me go back out to this one. I now, got Drayton, so many. Drayton, who did that web page on the scale train site about all this? Um, I, I put this article together. So if people want to learn more about it, they can go to um, our articles tab on our website. Okay, so now Mitchell and Mike, didn't I hear him say something like these persnickety guys and if you're a rivet counter, and I thought he said it a little derogatory. <laughs> the guy's obviously a rivet counter. My gosh, this he did rivet. come across that way. I mean, <laughs> here he was saying, oh, those guys, those persnickety yeah. guys. And then he's talking about we're taking the off the Herald, and I'm thinking, Drayton, I hate to tell you, you're in the club too. You're in the club. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. Well, well, well said, Tony. Well said. <laughs> I got to take the log out of my own eye. There you go. <laughs> so, well, hey, anyway, at least it doesn't have orange paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. You, you got me, Mitch. You got me. As, as some of you might know, I'm a I'm a modeler who likes to model Genesee and Wyoming and yeah, Mitchell sure and. I try so hard, but no one ever takes my product suggestions on GNW. But you know, nobody likes GNW. But anyway, so going back up here, Mike, I want to talk a little bit about the Ferromex units. So, yes. you know, the Ferromex units are something that you have had a lot of uh, a lot of time spent into. I know you have a contact that you've been working with in Mexico for photography. What are some of the challenges that you've ran into with the Ferromex units? Well, one of the challenges that we ran into when we started uh, picking uh, the road numbers was one of these issues where about halfway through one of the deliveries, there was some there were some details that changed, and we didn't know I didn't notice it until we started selecting road numbers, and then we had to we had to rework pretty much all the road numbers that we had picked to get versions that were going to match what our tool what our tooling is. So the delivery, the delivery that we're working from, and I'll pull that up here in a second. Um, uh, oh, pardon me here. Let's see. We're doing uh, the uh, 4600 to 4659 series, which were which were built in January and February of 06. Uh, but at, at between 4630 and 4631, there's an air filter box door that changes on the side of the of the long hood on the engine, fireman side. And we we the details for our model are accurate for one version and not the other, and so while these are all came from the same delivery, they're not the same locomotive. Interesting. So, so you take that, you couple it with the fact that Ferromex has got numerous paint schemes uh, and variations in their paint schemes, uh, you know, which which made things a challenge. And so if you, this is another one of these deals where if you I think we're doing six numbers total, if I remember correctly, um, all of them are subtly different again because of that. Uh, we've got four in the original uh, green, green and red scheme, um, and we've got two, we we're doing two in what in the new in this latest scheme, which they call the zebra scheme. And uh, and so yeah, I've got a, a young man down in Mexico City. His name's Juan, who has helped out a great deal with photography. Uh, found him actually through Flickr. He's got a great Flickr page with a lot of great photography. And so he was the one who helped with that. And subsequent to him, I found a couple other gentlemen that have, that are, have been uh, been helpful as well. And so, um, you know, the uh, in the zebra painted units, which is like the one here that we're looking at uh, on the page, um, there's some variations in the way they did these. A couple of them, they actually didn't. They basically painted everything from the walkway up but everything from the walkway down stayed in the original colors. So you had black steps, you had the plow with the green and white stripes. This particular unit here this, that, uh, that we're looking at had a full repaint, or at least the entire uh, body was repainted. Um, so they didn't, and, and so again, there are some subtle differences. This paint scheme is gonna be quite a bit of a challenge for us for the, for the factory is already kind of crying a little bit about it. If you look at towards the rear of the locomotive, the Ferromex lettering and the gray, the two-tone gray striping actually goes across all of the, the photo etched grills. And so those grills are going to have to have three different colors applied to them uh, to be able to accurately do it. So this is going to be another one of those uh, challenging schemes that we're going to have to wait and see 
what the factory finally comes up with when we get there. Um, but we're, uh, we're cautiously optimistic that based on what they've done for us in the past, they're going to be, they'll be able to come through, uh, for us on it. This is a video by, uh, FXE 4010. And this is, uh, this is one of the new ES 44s in that paint scheme. And, uh, Man, I tell you, some of these videos that you see from Mexico are just wild. I, I tried to find a video earlier. I wasn't able to find it because the title was in Spanish. But uh, And, of course, I'm not very fluent in Spanish. I know how to say I like Chinese food in Spanish, but that's about it. But uh, So I wasn't able to find that video, but this video I think is pretty cool. And um, you can see the anti-vandalism grates there on the windows. And that's one of the, look, one of the features that we're going to offer – uh, on our models, which is unique. And I think, Mike, the first locomotive that we've decided to offer those grates on uh, is the SDL 39, correct? Yeah, the, yeah, the Chilean SD, uh, SDL 39 will have that as well. On our on the prototypes for these, those grills are actually removable. And so typically what you will see is when, when you see feral mix units running here in the States, they actually take them off before they, before they cross the border. Oh wow! And yeah, so they're either they're either bolted on, or from my understanding is from my sort from our sources is that the the latest ones are actually magnetic, and so they just they just kind of stick them on the stick them up on the locomotive, but they but they do they remove them off the locomotive. So typically you won't see them running north of the border with those on. So to see well, this, and and we've got a viewer here, Chili Sub Customs, with a great question: Will will we sell? the rock screen separately for Mexican modelers to have foreign power with the correct rock screen. So I guess what he's saying is that when foreign power, like a BNSF locomotive or a Union Pacific locomotive ends up in Mexico, they actually put those yep. screens over the windows of those locomotives. Is that true? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I've seen photos of other roads down there where they'll actually add them um, mm -hmm. you know, for that same reason. Well, I don't know. I mean, that might be something that we offer in the future, but, uh, for right now, I think we're going to focus on, you know, including those screens on locomotives as they're, you know, as they're made from the factory. Maybe yeah. in the future we could look at doing that. We get and asked Mike, about. Go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. I was, going to, I was just going to say is that you know, pay attention to the photos uh, or the artwork on our website. Some of the models are coming with them. Some are coming without. So we're trying to cater to both modelers south of the border and north of the border as well. So whether you're doing them. Uh, uh, whether you're doing them either, uh, you know, for some running in Mexico or running up here, you can pick a road name, a road number that'll uh, that'll actually be accurate. That's really cool. And uh, we it's got a great scheme. That scheme, both I love the red and green, but man, that new zebra scheme too. Oh, I think both those are just amazing looking. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I agree. And uh, another customer here. Sorry, I've just got I've got a lot of comments coming in. I'm trying to keep track of all my tabs. No pun intended. Um, Chris Scott asks, why do they call it the zebra stripe scheme? So, Tony, I'll let you answer that one. I would assume that it's because of the zebra stripes on it, just as they used to call the old Santa Fe unit zebra stripe. But, yeah, I, it may not be an official name. Mike, do you know if that's... I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't believe that it's official. Like I said, my, my, our, the sources that I'm, the sources that we're, that we're working with, that's, that's what they're referencing them. They actually call they they actually call this scheme the zebra scheme and the traditional scheme they actually call the Diablo scheme. Ah. So we've got some more footage here coming around the corner of uh, of this curve here. You'll see the the Ferromex locomotives there in the uh, red and green scheme. And you know I never really noticed it until I started looking at the artwork more closely. But the Ferromex units are kind of neat because they have all of those. Uh, arrows and the, the the X's there that you see on the side of the locomotive. Yeah. That's kind of a neat feature. Um, Mike, you know, so I think this is our first, if I'm not mistaken, this is our very first locomotive that we've offered in Rivet Counter for a Mexican railroad. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yeah, we did it. We did an operator SD40-2 in Ferromex, but this will be the uh, this will be the first one that we've done uh, as a Rivet Counter. And man, you're right. There is so many different paint schemes there for Ferromex. So that was really cool. And every once in a while, you'll see these locomotives and they'll break away and they'll end up here in the United States. Uh, several years ago, I remember seeing one in um, in Chicago. Actually, I was um, I was trackside with a friend of mine who actually works for BNSF, and um, 
we were sitting there and I see this red looking locomotive coming our way. And I'm like, what, what in the world is that? And uh, I look out and as it gets closer, I'm like, well, that's, that's gotta be like a Ferromex engine. Let me, uh, let me bring this up real quick. This is the one and only time I've ever seen one leading. And Mitch, this is a question that, that you would be able to answer. So I shot this video in 2016 and the lead locomotive, I don't think has PTC and PTC isn't required in Mexico, but I've never seen a Ferromex ES44 lead since then. I mean, I've seen him trail, but is that because of PTC issues? Well, nowadays, I mean, well, uh, for instance, me and, uh, have you met Tracy Drayton that comes over? Yeah, I've met Tracy. Okay. Yeah. Well, me and Tracy, for instance, got on, it wasn't a Ferromax, but we got on some power at the shop to get a train out of the yard, and it was a BNSF motor, and PTC didn't work. So, of course, the first thing they wanted us to do was swap it around. So, But with Ferromax, I don't – there's been instances to where, you know, they want you to – they'll let you go and run without PTC, but it's more of yes to have PTC on a lead locomotive nowadays. So I, mean, I would, I would give, given I would say – if you ever see any more, you would not see another one leaving. Mitchell, what was in the, was the cab bilingual? Was it English, Spanish on controls and things? Just out of curiosity, do you remember? Well, uh, on PTC, when you sign in on the PTC screens, the conductor will have one screen. It's, it, it, it depends, you got an option to give you what railroad of what you want you to log in on your PTC. That way it will recognize the area, the, the route, and everything that you're on and same with the engineer side but as far as the controls i've been on one before and it was english hmm. and that's the only one i've ever been on i've only been on one and everything was english on it yeah you don't you don't really see these ferromex engines a whole lot but when they when they are in a train somewhere there's always a dozen rail fans out chasing it i mean we we had a an sd70 ace Actually, it might have been an M dash too, but we had one that came through the Chattanooga uh, area recently, and my goodness, it was a uh, it was a a very interesting experience. We had about fifteen people chasing that train. I'm sure that train crew got tired of having their picture taken, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's just not something you see every day, and uh, it's just kind of cool. So, um, moving along, I want to talk about a railroad that actually owns. Uh, a pretty big chunk of Ferromex, and that's Union Pacific. A lot of people don't really realize, but Union Pacific actually owns, I think it's over 20% of Ferromex, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the cool locomotives that we're offering, one of these paint scheme variations, is the 5,000th Evolution Series locomotive, road number 7964. And uh, this locomotive was delivered to Union Pacific in June of 2012, and it, in fact was the 5,000th locomotive uh, in the in the Evolution series that GE made. So um, I don't believe it's running around with the decals anymore. Is that correct, Mike? That is correct. I actually I actually shot this locomotive out in uh, out in Yermo um, a number of years ago. And uh, you can see the color, the the yellow color on the side of the nose where the where the where the uh, the decal was placed is slight is a little bit different in shade if you know what you're looking for and so you can tell that it you know that it was uh that it was something was there at one point but it yeah the the uh these logos are now gone gotcha gotcha tony it looks like you have some pictures too uh this is i know you're also doing regular run union pacific and i think this is close to the numbering series that you're doing this was uh rochelle Two or three years ago, our Modeler's Life, we do our annual barbecue and get together up there in Rochelle. And that's either my picture or my assistant editor, Shane Mason, because and that's my black link in there in the right corner, which I don't have anymore. I got a red Nautilus now, but it's like, as I was looking, I'm like, hey, there's my old Lincoln. Uh, but that's a nice mix of there's the Givo. And then what's that second one, guys? Is that a 60 or 70 Mac? 70 M. Yeah, and then a 70 Ace or whatever UP's calling them, and then one of those odd container. I think it's the first time I ever saw those, all those aerodynamic container things that they were putting on the front end of trains. 
So what in addition to the 5,000 you're doing some regular UPs, I think of this Building America with the flag, right, Drayton? Yes, yes, we are. And, and Mike could speak more to the road numbers, but that's one of the road names that we, we had requested most often. Um, you know, that a lot of people were asking, you know, hey, I want Union Pacific, I want CP, what about City Rail? And um, we said in August of last year that yes, we would offer UP and CP and City Rail in the next run. Um, we didn't say anything about Ferromex because I don't think that we had originally planned on Ferromex, right, Mike? We just kind of decided well, on yeah, a little later. Yeah, Ferro, Ferromex came about because of the BNSF units. The Ferromex units, the Ferromex units are the only units in this in this run that are going that are early production units. Where everything else we're doing is everything else was all part of the original batch of tooling. When, like I said, when we did the BNSF units, um, you know, when we, when we were doing the tooling, I we did some we did, we did some research and found that the the Ferromex units are similar enough, and there were some minor changes that we were going to make so we could we could add uh, Ferromex to it, which was a road name that we that wasn't part of the original batch of tooling, and so that's that's how the the Ferromex units came came by way of the BNSF uh, 25th anniversary units. At least, gotcha. sooner, at least sooner than what we what we would have originally planned on doing. Well, we've got a, a compliment here from Canada's HO Scale Trains channel. Uh, he says, scale trains are really cool. They are great quality. Keep up the good work, guys. Well, thank you so much. That really thank means you. a lot to us. Um, it, it really is humbling to hear that people enjoy our product so much. Um, let me see here. We've got one more road name to talk about, and that is City Rail. So, you know, City Rail, these locomotives are pretty cool. Um, we'll go here and just kind of show everybody what we got, uh, scrolling back down on the road names again. Um, the, the City Rail units are really neat. Um, and a lot of people, like I said, they call them credit card Jeevos. And that's, of course, because you've got City Bank that owns them. I always thought it was kind of like because they sort of looked like a Visa credit card. But no, they... <laughs> Call them credit card Jeevos because, well, it's city rail. So, and of course, they're lease units as well. So, um, it's really neat. And Mike, I noticed these actually have uh, rear ditch lights. I didn't realize that these had rear ditch lights. Yeah, kind of unusual for for something of the lease unit. You know, typically lease units, you know, as at least from what I've seen as a tradition, is they they usually keep them as cheap and, and simple as possible. They don't, you know, lease units typically are no frills locomotives. At least, especially when they're bought brand new. So, to put rear ditch lights on them uh, was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting feature. Big time, yeah. And I, I tell you, I'd never seen one of these locomotives until a few years ago. And uh, I'm trying to bring up the 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 footage here. I went to Deschler, Ohio, and a lot of people, um, you know, that like trains and like going to see a lot of trains in one place. The best place in Northwest Ohio to really go is Deschler, Ohio, and uh, I'll switch over here to my screen so you guys can see it. Back in uh, back in 2014, I went to Deschler, and uh, it was really cool. We were sitting trackside, and around the corner comes this CSX locomotive and this long string of silver and yellow-looking locomotives, and we couldn't really tell what it was. Now we're sitting there. It gets closer and closer and closer, and it is, I believe there are nine city rail credit card jivos here in this contest and so it was really cool to be able to see this in person and they look great they look great right fresh out of the factory i think these locomotives were being delivered from erie on their maiden voyage um this like i said this is just past dutchler ohio this location is here but uh man that was really cool to see in person is that about a case of a mic? Is that how you sell them? The nine to a case? So this yeah, is something like, I think something like that. Yeah, it's right, right in that ballpark. Man, that kid's got money if he's able to do that for his model. I'll just take a case of those. Yeah. <laughs> that would be something else. I mean, and the cool thing is, is it doesn't really matter what railroad that you model. These city rail Jeevos could run on literally any model railroad because they're lease power. Yeah. Um, and that's really the beauty of it. And you know, we get asked all the time about leasers, right? You know, people are like, well, you guys make leased units. And, you know, we'd love to make leased units, especially like SD45 car bodies and SD40-2s. But the challenge is the SD40-2s, oftentimes were not built new for leasers, unless it was like EMDX or somebody like that. But the uh, 
the GE units, you know, these were ordered new by city rail. And so, you know, in this modern era of railroading, a lot of railroads, they just want to lease power. And so, you know, back when these things were new, um, it really was a lot easier to make them because we didn't have to worry about all these, you know, different changes um, in their appearance that would have happened if they if they'd been on the railroad for like 30 years. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we decided to do city rail was just simply because these locomotives, they don't have a lot of variations because they're relatively new. Like, like I said, this footage right here was from 2014. So, um, you know, it's a lot easier to make a modern locomotive for a leasing company than it is for, you know, like uh, another company that has a couple of SD40-2s in the modern era. So anyway, but yeah, the, the city rail units are really cool to see. So enjoyed being able to I believe to see Canadian, I think CN, when they per, when they lease, uh, the ones that everybody's going through about the them being patched, I found an article, and I think I read somewhat to where they bought 75 of those, I believe. Wow. Yes, so... Yeah, I think it was 75 was the, the order that they had put in when they bought the city rail units. So I've only seen pictures of a few unpatched. Yeah, I've only seen a couple, and it's been it's been very, very, very recently that, that I've seen them. So, well, uh, we're coming to the end of our live stream, and I just want to open it up for about five minutes of questions. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in from viewers. We've got about 140 people watching right now. To those of you who are watching our live stream, I just want to give a shout out and say thank you for, for coming to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Um, we're, we're going to try to do more of these all about scale trains live streams. Uh, we probably won't be doing one every single week, but we will probably do one at least once a month. Just got to give you guys an update on products, uh, new announcements and things like that. And really for us, it's a, it's a great experience to be able to chat and connect with you guys. You know, Mitch, you know, you're you're a railroader, but you're also one of our customers. And so to hear from somebody like you that actually works on the prototype but also enjoys our products is, is really an honor and really a humbling experience. So thanks for being here with us tonight as well. Help us out with the YouTube algorithm, guys. Thank you for guys. having me. Hit that like button. Yeah, Mitch, thank you. Thank you. So um, we'll just go with a few questions. Um, one question, this is a question for Mike. Um, Mike, uh FEC, Florida East Coast. What what about Florida East Coast? Have we looked at doing FEC? We have looked at it. We can't currently do FEC. So it, it's something that it's something that will probably happen with another round of tooling. Uh, if I remember correctly, the FEC units are early, are early production C4s. And uh, again, you know, when the original tooling was done, it was it wasn't our intention to do early units, at least not initially. Um, but we can thank BNSF for that uh, opportunity, and so we 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 followed that up with that. But uh, FEC at some point probably. Uh, Michael White asks, "What's the horsepower rating for an ES forty four AH?" Mitchell, you might be able to answer that one. Forty four hundred. And so ES 40. meaning Evolution Series. 44 as in yes. 4,400 horsepower and the AH is for the type of trucks they have. Um, that I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, I think it has something to do with those steerable trucks. Okay. Let's see. We've got a few more comments coming in. Now this isn't an ES 44 question. I can answer this one. This one's one that we get asked all the time. How about Southern equipment, both diesel and steam? Think about deaf modelers like me. So, uh, Amy, I believe I saw one of your comments on another one of our, our YouTube videos, and uh, I think it's really cool that we get to share the hobby together. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of folks that, that are in our hobby. And, um, you know, for those who are hearing impaired, we also offer locomotives that are DCC ready. So they don't have a decoder in them but they are DCC ready. So if you have a decoder that you want to put in there and still run on a DC layout, but you don't necessarily want uh, like, like a horn sound or anything like that, um, that's an option. So then that way uh, the cost, it saves you a little bit uh, not having to buy a brand new sound locomotive. So appreciate you tuning in. And uh, I hope that YouTube is auto generating captions so that you can uh, join in on the conversation. But either way, thanks so much for being here with us tonight. It's really humbling uh, to have you here with us. Um, Stephen Palmer says AH has to do with weight question mark. So I'm guessing he's wondering if that's that's what it has to do. 
Um, Cynthia McCree says, it's my birthday today. Well, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday with us. Let's see if we got any more questions coming in. If, if you guys have a question about ES44s, this is the time to ask. We got one here from uh, Shays N Scale. Is there a run of N Scale ES44s coming out too? It's something that's been talked about. No immediate plans, though. But gotcha. on, on the list of things that we have, we're taking a look at. So this isn't a question, but Chris Scott leaves a comment. He says there's one Union Pacific Jivo that has a pink ribbon. They call it the breast cancer unit, I think. Um, is that one that we've considered doing, Mike? Uh, I have. We have not taken the time to look into it yet to see if that's a body variant that we can do. That's going to be another early unit. That one, the Boy Scout unit uh, as well. Both of those are, are early production units. And so, quite frankly, just have not had the time yet to sit down and go through the details on them to see if how close what we've got is going to be for it. So, so again, something we're going to want to do at some point. Not quite sure that the tooling is there right as we speak. Gotcha, gotcha. Caleb, the rail fan, comments and says, the H in the class CW44AH and the ES44AH refers to the HTE High Tractive Effort Adhesion Management Software with which those units are equipped. So there, there you have go. it. That's what that there stands for. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple more comments coming in. Um, someone asked, what about fantasy units? Uh, again, something we've talked about. You know, the, problem that, the problem that we struggle with, obviously, is if you – you do a fantasy unit and you put it in a rivet counter box, you know, uh, not everybody's going to, you know, it's one of those situations where maybe not everybody's going to be happy with that because it isn't, you know, rivet counter has always stood for, you know, detail, uh, road name, road number, specific detail. And so fantasy locomotives at that level, um, again, uh, not sure. You're not sure yet. Like I said, not you know. There's still plenty of still plenty of stuff to be done that is accurate, and so we're. I think we're going to focus that direction at least at the moment. Not to say that we won't uh, at some point, but uh, I think the folk we're going to focus on the ones that we can can do accurately. <laughs> the Bob's in scale man cave asks, "Where is Shane?" And Shane commented and said, "I'm sitting in my easy chair watching the experts." <laughs> <laughs> well, Shane, we're glad. Everybody wants glad to talk to the president. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to talk to the president. El Presidente. Well, we're, we're glad to have you here, Shane, and hope you're enjoying that lazy chair. Let's see. We've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, there's so many coming in here. There was a good one that I saw up here. Uh, what does the AC I see one somebody for? asked what AC means, and that's yeah. A, it's that AC tra AC traction motors. There it is. Which is alternating tractions. Yes. Gotcha. Uh, Shane says, "Thanks for being the roadie, Mike." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, uh, really appreciate you guys spending your evening here with me, Mike. I know it's afternoon out there in California, so go out there and uh, enjoy a. Uh, in and out Burger for me. I wish I could go out there and, and enjoy one. That just sounds <laughs> so good right now. Um, Mitchell, appreciate you spending the evening with us after a day of work on the railroad. Uh, really appreciate your insight there about the prototype. Um, it's just really okay. cool to hear your stories about working on the railroad. And, um, you know, of course, Tony, thank you so much for your commentary and the great photo collection that you guys have out there at White River. And I want to say, guys, uh, wait, 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 go check Drayton, out. Drayton, what was Sunday? Sunday what was, was Sunday? Sunday was. <laughs> Help me out. I'm drawing a blank. I think it was oh, Father's, man. Father's Day. The yes. last Sunday was Father's Day. Sorry. The last time we met, you told me I couldn't buy my dad a tie for five, Father's Day. Trains, not awesome. ties. Yeah. So aren't you going to ask me what did I get my dad for Father's Day? What did you get your dad for Father's Day? Well, we happened to be doing the new KCS Tier 4s in my first issue of Diesel Era, and my dad's nice. got some pictures in there because he lives over in Illinois on the old Gateway Western. 
And dad, who generally would look at modern power and go, I know it's an EMD or a GE, but it's just something with ditch lights, has suddenly, <laughs> has suddenly become this like more interested in rail fan stuff. And about a week before Father's Day, he said, I'd like to have examples of those KCS units that come through town. And I went and found it. Show me lines here in the Kansas City area. I got 5013, your scale trains, GVO tier four with sound for dad for Father's Day. 13 was his basketball number in like high school and such. So I got well, 50. That's cool. And awesome. got him his first. And he was, you, know, you could tell he was looking at it and all oh, this is because, again, you know, he's like me to where we're more the, the F unit SD45 Jeep 30 guys. So. But yeah, there you go. I did exactly what you said. No tie. I got him a scale trains Jeevo for Father's Day. Good well, thank deal. you so much. Thank <laughs> you. We, we appreciate that, Tony. And I tell you, uh, I Father's Day was a blur for me because I had to take a special trip to Bryson City, North Carolina at four o'clock in the morning. And I was not going there for a steam locomotive at the uh. Great Smoky Mountains. I had something else to take care of, but uh I pretty much slept through most of Father's Day, so it's this whole week has been a blur. But uh, it, it was, uh, you know, I'm really thankful. I'll say that, you know, about my dad. You know, I'm really thankful for my dad for supporting my hobby, for taking me trackside when, when I was just a little kid. And my dad actually bought my first um, model train. It was a blue box model, and I can remember remember it very vividly. I was about five years old, and uh, that was that was just something I've never forgot. And so. He's really who I owe this crazy hobby that we all have and, and love to enjoy. But uh, really thankful for my dad. And thank you all for participating in our Trains Not Ties promotion. And, you know, really appreciate that, Tony. So without further ado, I just want to say thank you to all of our viewers. Thanks for tuning in here uh, to our latest All About One more Scale question. Oh. One more question. Okay. Yes. Um, of course, everybody knows uh, it's kind of off topic that, Train Fest is canceled this year? Yeah, it's very sad. Is that correct? Okay, yeah. so with you guys, I guess this might be a Drayton question, maybe a Mike question. The next train show that you guys plan on attending have a booth set up or maybe your next announcement? Yeah, so our next show is going to be at the St. Louis Railway Prototype Modeler Show. Um, it is the last weekend in July. The show, I, I believe it's Friday the 28th, and it's going to be Friday and Saturday, and we're going to have a booth there. Um, Shane and Paul will be there. Um, Paul is from our product development team. You might have uh, recognized him from our last um, All About Scale Trains video on the tunnel motors. He'll be there in it. That is going to be our first show uh, since February. Actually, it might have been March of 2020 and uh man it has been so weird not going to train shows and not being able to talk to our customers um yes we're going to be at st louis rpm um you can find out more information about that on facebook um also we're going to make sure we put a mention of that in our newsletter and on our uh show schedule tab on our website um it like i said it has it's been really kind of strange because we haven't had any shows to go to so if you go here on our show schedule, you can see, uh, you know, the the shows that we're going to be at. We're also going to be at the Spring Creek Train Show in Deschler, Nebraska. Um, at uh, Spring Creek Trains, it's a huge, huge, huge hobby store there, um, and it is a, it's one of the best places in the Midwest to go and buy model trains. So yeah, I'm sorry, I spoke, I misspoke. It's July 30th and 31st, and uh, unfortunately. We, we just found out a few days ago, like everybody else, that Train Fest was canceled. So just ignore that November date there for Train Fest. But, uh, you know, 2022 is looking like um, a great year for scale trains as far as shows go. We've got some exciting plans um, that, that will actually involve bringing our products to you guys. And uh, I'm not just talking about train shows. So um, be on the lookout for that. If you haven't done it, like I said, subscribe to our YouTube channel and go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, usually two, three weeks before we go to a show or go to a model railroad club or different events like that, we'll put a note in the newsletter like, hey, you know, we're going to be at this location and, and all that. So, But otherwise, the show schedule tab on scaletrains.com, that's a great place to go. So 
Good question, Mitch. Didn't even think about that. So did did you want to go? Did you want to go ahead and tell me since you said Train Fest is canceled, and I'm sure Mitch wants the answer to this too. Why don't you just go ahead and tell us what that announcement was going to be? Because I'm oh, just going to sit here. I'm going to sit here and oh yeah. About it. No. <laughs> well, you know, I uh, we had a presentation that we had to give at the largest model railroad club in Virginia last year, and uh, the presentation was a sneak peek of how model trains are made and. Me being the dumb blonde that I am, forgot my hotel, for, forgot my hotel, forgot my laptop in the hotel. And uh, I had to stay at the club while Shane had a long drive back to the hotel to get my laptop. And Shane has a great story that he tells about that evening. That's one of the top three moments in his life that he's been the angriest. And somehow I survived and I still have a job. But I know that if I went and told everybody what our exciting new locomotive happens to be, uh, I definitely would not have a job or a laptop. So uh, I can't put the cart before the horse, Tony, but nice try. Right. I, don't, I don't want to stir up any trouble then, Drake. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I will wait. We'll, I will patiently wait. <laughs> well, hey, I really appreciate you guys joining us tonight. And shout out to all of our viewers and, and all of our customers that support us. And uh, we wouldn't, we, we seriously would not be able to do what we do without you. So, and last thing I want to say before we sign out, if you have a product suggestion or idea, email us your photos, those detailed photos that we talked about earlier, to ideas at scaletrains.com. Again, that's ideas I get at scaletrains.com. <laughs> Send us an email. <laughs> AC so, all right, guys. <laughs> AC4400. Well, you never know. You never know. Well, all right, guys. Y'all have a great end of your Thursday evening and a great weekend. Thanks for joining us tonight on All About Scale Trains. Have a good night, everybody. See ya.